Welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. Let me take a minute to introduce myself and um, our other panelists here today. So um, I'm Kat King. I'm an instructional technologist at Diablo Valley College in the Contra Costa Community College District. Um, I am a part-time English instructor at Diablo Valley College and also at um, Las Casitas College, which is part of the um, Chabot Las Casitas Community College. Um, and here with us today, um, we have uh, Maritez. Maritez, will you say hello? Yes, hi everyone. My name is Maritez Apigo. I'm a distance education coordinator, OER coordinator and English professor at Contra Costa College. And you can see my Twitter handle there if you're on Twitter. Awesome. Yes, definitely connect. Um, I should put, I'll put mine up after the fact too or drop it into chat. We'd love to connect with you all on social media. So, um, and also uh, we have, uh, thanks for joining us, Martez, and we have joining us, Brandon. Brandon, you wanna say hello? Hello everybody, good morning. Uh, my name is Brandon Marshall and I'm an English professor at Contra Costa College. Uh, I wish I had more titles to add to my name, but that's coming. Uh, I do have the distinction of being a tenure tracked employee in the time of COVID. <laughs> that's always been uh, um, interesting. That is big. That goes a long way. I know. And Martez, you're giving us all a complex with all your uh, all your titles. <laughs> it's, it's not <laughs> that it you all. should. It's not that you <laughs> wish you should have more. It's that I have too many. Is the <laughs> that's that might be true too. Um, and we also have um, uh, here in our panelists. Um, we have some folks from Hypothesis here to support who can help with responding in chat. Um, and um, you know, just helping to answer questions. So, um, Franny, Jeremy, Nate, do any of you? Becky, would you like to say hello? Hello, Hi, everyone. Thanks everyone for being here. Greetings. Um, awesome. So, thanks so much to the Hypothesis uh, amazing team that just you know makes all of this happen. So, thank you so much. Okay, let's see. Okay, um, so before we get started, just a little bit about, um, we're, we're going to kind of track the usage of hypothesis through um, the community, the Con Contra Costa Community College District, and that is comprised of uh, three different colleges. So we have um, Diablo Valley College, which has a campus in Pleasant Hill in San Ramon. Um, we have Los Madonos College which has a campus um, in Pittsburgh and Brentwood, and then the Contra Costa College in San Pablo. So we're kind of in that um, Bay Area, California. You can see us on the map right here. And I thought it'd be important to note that we are a Canvas um, campus. And so we are using Canva, uh, the Hypothesis LTI integration with um, Canvas and Hypothesis. So, um, we thought that Hypothesis is, would be a particularly valuable tool for community colleges in part because community colleges don't have like the, the filter of a competitive application process that you see in you know, some of the UCs and the Ivy Leagues where you really get to decide who your students are and you know that your students are gonna have like very strong academic skills once they show up in your classroom. Um, the community college is like the really true agents of upward mobility. We get learners from all different levels. People come to us, you know, all different stages. And if you wanna take classes with us, we will welcome you with open arms and meet you where you're at. And so um, uh, another important thing is to, to think about with the community college and college in general is we're talking about adult learners and adult learners truly like vote with their feet. And so if they don't feel supported, if they don't feel connected, if they don't um, feel welcomed, they will leave. Uh, particularly at the community college where it's not, it's, it's pretty affordable. It's not that expensive. Um, and so if you just want to leave, you know, it's not like you're out your $80,000 tuition. Um, people do kind of pop in and pop out. 
And so um, the focus at community colleges has really been on like strong quality teaching and interaction with students over things like, um, you know, research or things like that. So, um, so there is this strong focus on meeting students where they're at, supporting students and, and helping them meet their career education goals or their transfer level goals. Um, and uh, another thing about, I think just instructors in general are of any level is that we're chatty. So if you get a group of instructors together in a room, we're gonna start talking about uh, our, our students and how to support our students or speculating um, pre-COVID when you know we spent a lot of time in professional development centers and staff development labs you know, you'd hear instructors talk about like, well, why are students struggling with reading? And there's all kinds of speculation out there. Um, you know, some people are like, well, maybe they're just too busy or they're, they're too distracted, right? We've all lost our attention spans or maybe they're too apathetic, they just don't care. Or maybe they're too unprepared. In California, we had a, a, a bill AB705 that really dismantled a lot of the, support level courses um, that were offered in English and math. And so um, for, for some good reasons, but there was a lot of speculation about, well, you know, maybe just taking away those courses. Now, now our students aren't ready for college reading. Of course, there's always the like, is it me? Do I suck as an instructor? Or do I assign bad text or whatever? But you know, there, there wasn't really a good way to answer those questions and that speculation that came up. And um, we, we were interested in hypothesis to potentially help us answer some of those questions and, and give us some, you know, some data about why that might be happening. Uh, because hypothesis and social annotation can, can make reading visible. You can see if students are doing the reading. You know, you can see how they're interacting with the text and if they just don't get it or if they're um, misinterpreting or whatever it is. And so, um, uh, we also know that we have a problem with reading instruction in our country in general. Um, that there are some serious disparities along along racial lines, and you know the statistics just do not look good in general. Um, on this is an article published in Forbes over the summer that um, showed that on national tests last year, only 18% of Black fourth graders scored proficient um, or uh, or excuse me, um, above in reading. And even if you flip to white students, that is still only 45%. So, you know, whatever, you know, culture, uh, race, you know, like it, it, it's not going so well with reading. And so we know that we need to do something different because um, those, those reading skills are important that students with um, greater struggles in school are going to be less likely to graduate or to show up in our college classrooms, um, more likely to be incarcerated. Um, so, so we need to do something differently with the way that we're teaching reading. Sorry, I got a small screen for myself here. Okay, so and uh, a little bit about my own personal interest in hypothesis. Um, Anybody in chat want to take a take a guess at what all of these people here have in common? So we've got Whoopi Goldberg, you know, Bill Gates, Robin Williams, Tom Cruise, Gavin Newsom, Agatha Christie, Jay Leno, Steven Spielberg, and um, a uh, by some estimates you know, like 50 to 80% of uh, incarcerated people. Okay, I'm seeing in, in chat, yes, uh, they're readers. I hope that's true about all of them. <laughs> Learning disability, yes. And I, uh, and I see uh, now here the answer, um, dyslexia. So, um, so yeah, these, um, these are all humans with, uh, with dyslexia. And um, 
dyslexia is something that um, really kind of runs uh, rampant in, in my family tree, but also is just the most common learning disability impacting up to 15% of the population. And, um, sorry, let me click here. I think it's something that I'm starting to see more conversations about uh, uh, among educators, but isn't as widely talked about as you as you'd think. Um, it is a neurobiological difference in the way that the brain, you know, interprets reading. So it makes reading really difficult and really time consuming. And so it's possible when our students are struggling with reading in our courses that they're not just blowing us off or going out with their friends or too busy with too many jobs or whatever the reasons are. It's, it's possible that they're, they're actively doing the reading and working really hard at it, but they have a learning disability that makes reading more challenging for them. And um, one of the things about hypothesis that I think is, is so valuable is that it can help provide that kind of just in time help for those students. Um, while recently uh, there have been some states that have passed laws to try to do some universal screening for elementary school students for dyslexia, um, this is very recent. I don't think we're going to see the trickle up effects of that for a long time. So for the most part, students are in our classes right now and they don't know they have dyslexia. Um, what happens is they show up in our classroom with this like imposter syndrome where they feel like they're dumb. They feel like they don't get it. Um, they feel like, you know, they're they're just maybe not supposed to be there. And that is not true at all. Dyslexia is not a sign of low intelligence. I think if you think about the people on this last flat side, there are like really brilliant people, successful people with dyslexia. But if you think about the high, high, really high rate of um, incarcerated people with dyslexia, it's also true. I think that there's something about our educational system that you know, maybe over prioritizes certain types of intelligences um, that, you know, makes things harder for a, a dyslexic student to, to, to get their degree, to follow that traditional pathway of sort of achieving the American dream. And so, um, and, and it's hard for us. I, I think some people have a sense that like, oh, dyslexia is like an elementary school thing where a, a kid flips their Bs and their Ds. It is a neurobiological difference, difference meaning it stays with somebody through their, through their life. And you can learn uh, strategies to uh, live successfully and even be a successful reader. You know, Agatha Christie is identified as uh, dyslexic. So it's it's not like, you know, these students are never going to be able to read, but um, but there needs to be really explicit instruction and hypothesis and social annotation. Um, I was interested in the way that we can really make reading strategies visible for these students, you know, something that ha usually happens in our head. Now with hypothesis students can see, oh, as my teacher was reading this, she highlighted this passage and you know, maybe posted this little, a little video explaining this concept or, oh, this student said this in this part. So it looks important. I'm going to stop and pay attention and think about that. It, you know, it really allows us to provide that like just in time support at home when students would normally be isolated, trying to get through difficult texts in our classes without a, um, a big support system. Okay. So having said kind of a little bit about our interest as a district and my own personal interest, I wanted to turn it over to our uh, other panelists, uh, Maritez and Brandon, to hear about the cool ways that um, Contra Costa College instructors are using hypothesis. So uh, let me stop sharing and pass over control to uh, Maritez. Thank you, Kat. Uh, it's, it's such an honor and privilege to be with you all and, and all of the attendees here today. 
Um, I'll share a little bit about how I've been using hypothesis in my freshman reading and composition courses. So with AB 705, um, it's a California law which basically eliminated all of the um, below transfer level English courses. Um, and so students, when they come to our community colleges, they begin in a transfer level English course. Um, uh, I'm based on, uh, there's also some um, AB705 work that's happening in ESL too. And so one of the courses I'm gonna share with you today is um, how I use hypothesis in uh, an English course that has an ESL focus. So um, my group of students, it, they, they've, they're English language learners. They're still developing their, um, their language skills in English. Um, some of them may have gone through our ESL program all the way up to the advanced level, and then they go into my class next. Some of them are generation 1.5 students who um, you know, may have taken some ESL in high school. Um, <clears throat> and, um, and then I also have um, you know, just students who might be referred from other English professors who identified ESL students. And they're like, you know, you should, you should head over to this section because this section is really gonna help you with um, you know, your grammar development and, um, and helping you um, uh, as an ESL student. So, um, so that's a little bit about the course that I'm gonna share about. And uh, one of the things that we do at the very beginning is um, I introduce to them six reading comprehension strategies. Um, and they are uh, making connections. So, you know, I ask students to, um, as they read, make connections to it. And that could be connecting <clears throat> what they read to their lives. It can be connecting um, it to other books or articles or movies or songs, events. So, you know, as you're reading, think of like what this reminds you of. Um, another strategy is to visualize. So um, I ask students to, you know, create pictures in your mind when you read. Um, you can picture, you know, as you're reading, what can you visualize? Um, or what's the, the movie that's playing in your head as you're reading? Um, another strategy is to ask questions because good readers ask questions uh, before, during, after their, <clears throat> their reading so that they can get a better understanding. Um, <clears throat> some more strategies are to infer. So really teaching students like how do you read between the lines? How you draw conclusions uh, based on what you're reading? Um, there's another one on determining importance. So <laughs> teaching students how to um, pull out the big ideas, um, especially when students are asked to summarize something that they read, they're, ha they're having to determine, well, what's important? How can I uh, sift out all of the unnecessary um, details? Um, and then synthesize. So how do you use what you've read to start creating your own ideas um, and form new ideas and interpretations? So those are like the six reading comprehension strategies that um, I teach my students at the beginning. And um, I've been using the reading apprentice, apprenticeship framework for about two decades now. <laughs> it's been a really fundamental part of my, my pedagogy um, when teaching reading and writing. And um, I started using this um, when I was teaching high school um, and I'm still using it um, when I transferred over to the California Community College system. And um, I can drop in the chat a link to the um, a link to the um, reading apprenticeship information in case anyone's interested by West Ed. Um, you know, they're incorporating four dimensions of reading, social, personal, cognitive, and knowledge building. And it's really about getting students to have a metacognitive conversation about what they read. So to actually make their thinking, be aware of their thinking. So, one of the things I do when I teach these six reading comprehension strategies is I kind of fuse in the reading apprenticeship framework into that. And I first uh, model for my students how I read. And so I'll do a think aloud where, um, you know, I'll, I'll read a piece and then I'll stop and actually, um, you know, vocalize my thinking out loud so that they can hear what's going on in my brain 
So they can hear me ask the questions. They can hear me visualizing. They can hear me synthesizing um, out loud. So when I do that modeling and thinking aloud, um, I'm <laughs> then wanting them to start incorporating those strategies into their own reading when they when they do it on their own. So um, I've used hypothesis to practice these uh, reading strategies. And um, you know, I ask the students to tag their strategies that they're using as they're putting them into the margins, you know, tag when you're asking a question, tag when you're synthesizing. And um, you know, also for ESL students, you know, we incorporate some kind of vocabulary building in there too, so that um, stu uh, students, as they're reading, they're identifying any unknown words to them. So since um, all of our, you know, readings connect to what they're going to then be writing about, um, I encourage my students to also make little private annotations to themselves as they come across any possible quotes that they may want to cite later on in their writing. And so um, they can always go back when it's time to, to write the essay and already have kind of some pre-selected quotes that they have in the margins. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen, just a little bit of the feedback that uh, we received from our students at Contra Costa College about hypothesis. So we asked students, how useful was it for you as a learning tool? And we got 103 respondents to this uh, survey. And as you can see here, the majority was hitting the fours and the fives, thought it was really useful for their learning. And then how exactly did you find Hypothesis helpful? And um, the one that got the most, 72%, is it helps me think critically about the reading, which is one of our main goals in teaching English is to get students not only to develop their reading and writing skills, but their critical thinking skills. And um, another important one um, that the students marked was that it helped me understand the reading. And, it, and I learned a lot from my classmates annotations. And I think this is like one of the beauties of, of hypothesis is that not only can students type in their annotations, but there is um, the ability to reply to one another and they can have that whole conversation going on in that margin. Um, and then down here, it says, what features of hypothesis did you find most useful? And I found it really interesting that 68% of our students hit, hit annotation replies. They really liked being able to um, to go back and forth with their peers about what they're reading. So it's not really something that they're doing in isolation, but that it's something that becomes interactive among one another. So that's amazing. So some other, um, some other ways that, um, oh, and I'll share one more uh, quote because uh, um, that I read when the students were able to you write some of what their, their uh, feedback was on hypothesis. And one student wrote, hypothesis is great for discussing aspects of reading and expanding on each other's annotations. I like being able to see which part of the reading stood out to other students with the highlighting tool and seeing if someone wrote annotations about the same parts that I did. One of my colleagues, um, Ben John, uh, he teaches creative writing at Contra Costa College. He uses it for groups of students to exchange peer review and feedback on their own work. So he'll take, you know, if students are writing poetry, he'll take uh, a group's poems and make it into a PDF and then share that with another group who can go in and annotate with their um, peer feedback. And, and, and so I thought that was a really creative use of hypothesis. And um, we're starting to now um, have a lot of interest in our journalism department. They're having students go in and annotate news articles. Um, and we even have a nursing faculty member who is, um, who's using hypothesis now too. Um, and I know that um, my colleague Brandon has a lot of uh, creative ways on, on how he's using hypothesis. So I'll turn it over to him. Thank you, Maritaz. Uh, 
I use a lot of the same uh, things that Meritess has talked about. So instead of kind of recreating a lot of what she's saying, uh, I wanted to build first off kind of looking at how students respond to uh, hypothesis. Uh, and so I put together uh, a list of uh, unsolicited student thoughts. And I thought there's a couple that I really want to highlight here. Uh, these are basically uh, students who will chime in on uh, my announcements, a couple uh, twice weekly announcements. I'll just put comments in. And these are basically where the comments come from. Um, and so this is kind of really interesting, right? The, the hypothesis assignments were fun. I enjoyed the various components and seeing people's thoughts and opinions while reading. Looking forward to this week. Um, I love this comment here, include more articles. When have we heard that? I mean, seriously, include more articles with this class. I seem to enjoy your readings and always left me wanting more. And that's coming from someone that would always say reading sucks. <laughs> and so I, I consider that a, a win. Uh, and it says, uh, I'm always, ex I'm excited to tackle the assignments. I enjoy the annotations on the narrative. It's interesting to read the insights of our various students. Um, and it just comes in over and over and over uh, that we're seeing students really take to hypothesis in these big, big ways. Uh, and uh, in my conversations with, with students, one of the things I've really realized that the value of hypothesis is it allows me to decenter authority within the classroom. Uh, one of the, I think students, in my experience, in my conversations, they tend to show up in the classroom not having done the reading. I'm like, well, why didn't you do the reading? Well, I didn't know if I was doing it right. I'm, you know, uh, and, and that's so super frustrating to me. Uh, but I realize that uh, with our educational system and the really kind of top down um, lecture format, students have, aren't reading because they generally don't have to because they'll show up in a classroom and the teacher will say everything that uh, the teacher wants to say and that authority is they're kind of gri gripping onto that authority uh, to, as a life raft. Uh, so with hypothesis, I set a culture up almost immediately in the classroom that there are no right or wrong answers. I'm not after an end game of uh, making sure did you get it right. <laughs> you know, uh, what I do is I, I set up the same type of rent uh, reader apprenticeship that Meritez does with the same kind of response strategies very early on, uh, and then I encourage them to comment to one another. And I take a step back. It really allows me to go into the background uh, and act as a cheerleader. And so I'm able to practice appreciative response uh, and and really highlight when students are. Uh, saying amazing things, some many times not something that I would never have even considered. Uh, and so uh, we're able to then kind of build on these amazing, amazing ideas throughout the course. Um, and so uh, that decentering of authority, I think, is, is crucial to uh, getting our students um, to, to start to read. Uh, and especially at Contra Costa College, where we uh, come from working class uh, community of, of immigrants uh, and reading is not generally uh, a, a, an enjoyable experience in their past. Uh, it's often a, a, a site of, of defeat being told, oh no, you are wrong. And so uh, with hypothesis and, and the building of a cultural understanding of these various texts, we can really start to um, shine the light on our scholars. Uh, and they start to believe the, that they're scholars because they are scholars. And so I think that's one of my favorite parts uh, of using hypothesis. Uh, and then I never use it as a standalone assignment. Uh, it's, it forms kind of the core foundation of the class, but then it, it branches out into every other thing that we're doing within that, that unit. And so um, even when we go back to campus someday, right, someday, Going to happen someday. Uh, but when we end up going back to, to campus, hypothesis is going to really allow me to flip the classroom uh, in some interesting ways, right? So instead of working with, uh, with, with giving a lecture, which I despise lecturing, but instead of working with give a lecture, I can, we can already have built an understanding of a text uh, outside of the classroom. And then when we show up in class, we can uh, work on project-based application of that material and, and start to really build and grow uh, in some very creative ways. And so those are just some of kind of the, the theoretical ways that I'm using hypothesis. Uh, and I literally use it for poetry and short stories. Uh, I use it for uh, blogs and uh, editorials. And I use it in uh, kind of looking at web page rhetoric. And I use it, uh, I even figured out, found an old novel that had been 
a PDF and was an eminent domain. And so I broke that up and put it into hypothesis and we read a novel uh, together and uh, it's really the sky's the limit. Uh, social annotation is, is where it's at. Um, that's pretty much where I'm at. Awesome. It's so inspiring to, to hear, I think just the like different, like really innovative ways that, um, that hypothesis is being used in the classrooms. Um, thank you both for sharing like this, like I'm like taking notes and like writing down ideas myself as like, oh, I like, I want to try using it in this way. Um, um, in fact, uh, one of the things you were talking about, Brandon, got me thinking about the way that some DVC instructors are using hypothesis. Um, and and I will say that like at um, CCC, we're, we're seeing like growing, you know, usage of hypothesis uh, among like various disciplines and departments. Um, I think that's one really wonderful thing about community colleges is there isn't this sense that like, oh, like critical reading and writing skills are just like an English teacher's job. It's like, no, it's all of our jobs to like really Im improve uh, students reading and writing skills. Um, and I, I wanted to say, I actually see some uh, people here, some of our participants, I know our, our instructors in um, at DVC and in our district who've really inspired me. And if you are here and you have a favorite way that you've uh, used hypothesis in your classroom, um, I see some LPC, uh, Las Positas instructors I work with that are here. Um, that I know have great ideas, like share, uh, we'd love to hear your ideas in the chat. Um, in fact, I, I saw um, Chris is here and um, Chris is our PD coordinator and um, an art instructor at um, GVC. And she uses hypothesis from day one to like, instead of doing a syllabus quiz in the classroom, which can feel kind of weird, um, she has students annotate her syllabus and it becomes really interactive and they're using, you know, sh she showed me where her students are using, uh, well, GIFs or GIFs, I don't know what side you all are on, I don't want to start a war there, but, uh, <laughs> you know, to, to really like start to build that community with her students from, from day one. And Brandon, um, now to circle back to what you were talking about, about, um, giving your students some kind of sense of like a like authority and feeling like they get to like join these conversations. We have a, a really amazing instructional librarian, um, Emily Moss, who has inspired my use of hypothesis. Um, she leverages hypothesis to have students, um, you know, look at the ways, look at, evaluate sources on the open web, um, you know, thinking about like the fact that sometimes as instructors, we send students to these, you know, literary or academic journals that are behind the paywalls of our library. And it's great that students have access to them as, as students in our institutions. But, um, you know, though the voices that are published there aren't always reflective of like the really diverse voices in our society at large. And there's like a lot of interesting academic conversations taking place on like Twitter or just in the open web where you maybe get more representative, you know, ideas and voices. And so um, she's using hypothesis to teach, you know, informational literacy and about evaluating sources that goes beyond like, I think the traditional like crop text or, you know, it's like, really looking at how people can can establish and, and create authority and voice. And so um, uh, I think, you know, there are just so many ways. I love the idea of using it as like a peer review. Um, we, we have instructors that are using hypothesis to um, like in place of a Canvas discussion board because you do can, can layer now you're layering the conversation with students and the author of the text and the instructor, like all on, all on the place where the conversation 
you know, would naturally be happening ar around the text. And um, I, I like the fact that students see, see their names in the margins right next to a, a published author's name. So um, there, are just, there are just so many creative uses. Um, and, and I know we're getting close to the end of our time. We did want to talk just because we know um, Hypothesis is free to use on the open web, but when it goes to using it in the classroom, integrating it into a learning management system um, can be really useful because it makes instructor feedback and assessment really convenient. And we all know how strapped educators are right now. So we wanted to um, make sure we got in a few tips about how to find funding. Um, we did start with a pilot, and I think that if you can start with a small pilot, um, instructor demand and building up some, um, you know, some usage goes a long way. Uh, we used it in our district a Canvas shell, which was a great way to, you know, share training resources or sample assignments. People would say like, oh, here's an assignment I tried, and um, you can build up a lot of uh, use. Uh, interest and kind of support there. Um, I think uh, the hypothesis team is great at helping, you know, teams and colleges gather usage data. I, I have linked here a, a DVC funding proposal, um, if it's helpful for anybody to, to see that has like a sample assignment. Um, it has some um, sample annotations and that it has some data to support how hypothesis is being used to um, to support uh, to meet federal and state regulations for regular and effective contact in our online classes um, to build communities. So here are our instructor replies to student annotations. Uh, Brandon, you're you're up there. <laughs> um, so um, there are we we got you know the hypothesis team was great about helping us gather the data that we had like seventy one thousand two hundred thirty one annotations in our in our pilot. Um, that this was really a cross disciplinary tool. That, um, that we were getting really positive feedback from both instructors and students. And so um, pulling together that data, working with the hypothesis team is, you know, they make, it, they make it really painless to kind of pull these statistics that support the usage of this tool in our classrooms. Um, I'd also say that like, Funding can be hard in community colleges. We're, we're not typically funded very equitably, uh, but we did use uh, CARES funding in our district. Um, and uh, working with a local or a district distance ed committee, while those are distance ed tends to be kind of underfunded in general in the community colleges, um, those those teams will be good at helping identify funding, whether that's CARES funding or, um, you know, like student equity funding, um, it's, we call it SEEP on our campus, or even using um, program review to have departments identify the, the need for a tool like that can be um, really helpful. And um, just, you know, a couple of the, the main takeaways today, Annotation, I think, you know, can just really allow for that scaffolding and at home support. It doesn't have to be all text based. You can annotate with image, with video, with audio, um, which can help support students who are struggling with the text heavy learning. Um, and that, you know, social annotation really does lead to this increased sense of community where um, instructors and students in a class can really start to build a kind of a collaborative spirit. So um, with all that said, well, we've got like a minute or two here. Are there questions that have come up in chat that we can help answer? Let's see. You know, Kat, one question that came up was, 
and you guys did address it a little bit in chat was to focus, Dina was asking to focus in a bit more on this, uh, you know, exactly what kind of prompts you all use. I, and I know that you answered in the chat, but I'm wondering if maybe Marites and, and Brandon have specific examples of how they use prompts. Yeah, and uh, just real quick, because I was looking at the time, I know that we technically were only going to go to 945, but I think we're happy, to, I think Martez and Brennan to stay and chat with people another 10 minutes or so if, if people want to stay, but also we won't feel offended if people are like cruising off to other places. But yes, I'd love to hear um, Brennan and Mar Martez address uh, more about how you, how you deal with that. Uh, I do have a couple uh, assignments at the ready. We can kind of look at a, a couple of different whoops, versions of them. Okay. So where are they at? Okay. Took a second there. So here's just a, a few. Uh, I find that I like to use, uh, keep the instructions really clear, uh, simple in a lot of ways, especially in the beginning. This would be a very beginning one. I give a, a whole video that addresses one of the questions that came up about students having to learn another kind of app. So I give a video that just kind of goes through how that how they can utilize it and how it works. Uh, and Hypothesis is so very simple. Uh, I think they figured it out pretty quick. The, the main thing is students will forget to hit the post button uh, and so I just have to remind them early on to, to keep doing that. Uh, then, you know, I like to, to set it up with a, a little bit of a, of a video uh, discussion real quick. Sometimes I'll set the context or, or really just uh, encourage them to take chances with, uh, with their meaning making process and uh, that there is no right or wrong answer. I like to reiterate that uh, and then just leave a couple things to think about as I, uh, as I read through it. Um, I base most of things on the um, what I call the powerful passages strategies, just reader to apprenticeship, right? <laughs> it's just a, a take on it. Um, and uh, I find students really, really enjoy having these options of ways that they can uh, connect to the text. And then uh, here we also do it. Uh, this is another uh, sample of when uh, we use it for uh, peer review. Right? And so I think the key really with, this, with the uh, instructions is clarity. Uh, make sure we're really clear on what you want students to do, uh, and then make sure we're present in the in the conversation, uh, giving uh, praise to students who are uh, accomplishing these goals, and and show show everybody where uh, it's happening well, and then uh, students will continue uh, to take over that. Students like like to know that they're are winning, and the more wins that they accumulate, the more they want to win. So that ends up being kind of the key to um, most of my instruction: clarity. Uh, and support uh, and positivity. Yeah, Maritess? Yeah, I, I put um, a little bit about my prompt in the in the chat. Um, but you know, I think it, it is helpful just like how Brandon showed the, for the first hypothesis to have that how to video if you're teaching fully online. Um, so that students, um, you know, don't get overwhelmed by this new tool because we do want them to focus on the content. <laughs> um, but sometimes the technology can get in the way. So for the first time, it, it, it is good to just show them how to use it. And then um, after, after they figure that out on the first one, they're good to go for using hypothesis for the rest of the term. Awesome, thank you. Yes, um, I agree. And I, uh, as, as you're chatting, I saw a question come in to chat about um, you know, is this a tool, like there can be the sense that like we overwhelm our students with tech tools, but um, I I think hypothesis is in, intuitive and, and easy to use. There's not like a high bar for the technical aspect of it. It's, it's literally like you highlight the text and a little text box pops up and you can type in it or paste your YouTube link or whatever it is. And like, so, so there isn't this, like, you, you know, with something like Canvas, like you, you need to kind of 
really onboard students and give them like a lot of framework and understanding of how to use it. But with hypothesis, it's like a really quick onboarding process, which is is nice because I, I do agree that that can be a concern. Um, Jeremy, your hands up. What's up? Yeah, I wanted to take it in a pretty different direction from the from the practical. Um, I, I think it goes back probably over a year, Kat, that you and I have been talking about. I think in our first conversation, you mentioned AB 705, and I've sort of uh, learned more about it and really have had uh, the, the adoption within the California Community Colleges of Hypothesis is remarkable with the Contra Costa District kind of leading the way, but you know, Katie's here from uh, Las Positas and Chabot, which uh, is also moving forward as a district. So there's this huge adoption and a lot of folks have contextualized it in the, in the wake of AB 705 and the acceleration project. Um, and I had always, I just wanted this sort of reflection that I'd like to then hear your thoughts about. I'd always thought about social annotation be valuable in that context for one of the takeaways that you mentioned Cat, right? In the absence of those support level courses, being able to provide scaffolding and at home support in the attention, you know, a student that might normally be in a, in a class with a lot of, you know, maybe learners at a similar place. Now there's learners in lots of different places and this allows you to kind of zero in and see where different students are at. I don't think that's invalidated by the point I'm about to make, but I was really just, I don't know if it's far as not the right word, but I was just really, I thought it was really poignant, Brandon, that you mentioned that actually it's not the presence of authority that necessarily helps a student accelerate, right? It's not more authority, right? And more presence of authority. It's actually that possibly the removal and the decentering de of that. And that a student knowing that there's not necessarily a right way to read and that they are a scholar may be, <laughs> you know, I, I just, I, something clicked for me when you were talking about that, that was like, oh wow, that's, that's what's the, you know, one of the most powerful pieces here. I mean, I think it's both, right? You do need to be present. It's important. They need to know that there's a community and you mentioned this too, Cap. Anyway, that's something that hit me today and it's all based on stuff you guys have said, but I'd just be interested to hear your thoughts because I've always been fascinated about this AB705 context for the popularity of, of social annotation. Yeah, I think one of the really, um, you know, I guess transformative aspects of culturally responsive teaching is that, you know, you're taking that students actually bring something to the classroom, <laughs> that it's not all just coming from you and, and, and it's not like they're empty, right? And we're, we're giving them all the information. They bring a lot to our classrooms. And, um, you know, with hypothesis, if, if you just, you know, I'm in there jumping in once in a while to kind of steer the conversation, but it's, it's really centered around them and them helping one another out. And um, sometimes they're, they're kind of doing what I would do is like, wait, no, actually, I don't think the author's writing about that. Um, and so I'm just like, yes, so, <laughs> yes. So um, I think it's important, Jeremy, for us to, to recognize that, that, that our students um, have a lot to bring and it's, and it's about us trying to empower them to take it further. I'd like to jump in on that if I may. Um, Kat showed some, some numbers that show that I have a lot of responses. Uh, those responses are primarily when Meritess just said, I, I say, yes. Most of those responses are me going, yes, <laughs> I love it. Thank you, more please, uh, over and over and over and over and over again. Um, and I think students really are empowered by that uh, and then they jump in to take the lead. Uh, it's not uncommon. For me to, I mean, I, I grade these things and I might require four or five annotations. It's not uncommon for half the class to have 20 or 30 annotations in a, a particular document. It's incredible what uh, what happens when you step back uh, and let their brilliance come to the forefront. Uh, and so I think hypothesis it allows us to do that, but we're still present, right? We're always present. They know we're there. Uh, and we're just like, yeah, I described it to a colleague of taking a Taking a, a young sh uh, child, a shy child, to a um, to possibly to a, a, a like a playground, and just no, oh, get out there, have fun, yeah, I see what you're doing, that's awesome, uh, and and that child just kind of grows as a result of that, uh, and um, you know grows into uh, their scholarship. And so, uh, I'm already a fan. We know that <laughs> it's so many possibilities, and uh, I've heard so many great ideas that I'm gonna steal uh, moving forward. 
Yeah, so many, um, so many great things to think about. Um, yes, I, um, I, as you all were talking, I was just thinking about the way education has changed a, a lot for a lot of really good reasons. But if you think back to like that type of education, I think a lot of us got when we were, you know, students, not that we're not still all learners and students now, but like, you know, there's a sense of a traditional classroom where like you read something and then take a quiz on it, where, you know, as an instructor, you might ask a student a question and then they pick the multiple choice answer that's correct. I call it like the binge and purge model of education where, you know, you kind of pump students full of information and then expect them to like regurgitate it back to you with a right answer. Um, I think hypothesis has so much power to like, you know, uh, uh, again, like get beyond that and have students uh, be actual contributors to the conversation, right? Their annotations are additive. They're, they're making a connection to something in their life or they're seeing themselves as capable of questioning an author and be say like, oh, I don't think this person got it right, right? And, and so, um, I, I love that it, it makes education an additive experience. Like we're all going to grow from this rather than like, I, I just have to, I have to find the one right thing that I'm supposed to say and, and pick the right answer kind of thing. So, um, but that's, you know, really powerful. So, um, I'm looking at chat, I see, does anyone know if there are any Canvas Commons pages introducing students to how to use Hypothesis? Um, oh, uh, yeah, I see Nate's popping in with some, some, wet, uh, some of the Hypothesis support materials. That, that is one thing I really appreciated about the Hypothesis team is they've really gone out of their way to make like student support pages. There's some I, I think I see it coming in there, like the annotation tips for students that like help students think about like, well, what does it mean when my teacher tells me to annotate something, right? Because it's it, we want them to do more than just like highlight a text. Studies show that just highlighting isn't that effective, right? We want them to actually have a have a conversation, and so. Um, so there, there's a lot of great links there. And um, I don't know if I've seen something on the Canvas comments, but Brandon, looking at your stuff, I'm like, oh, you should put some of that up on comments if you're open to it, because it's beautiful. You've done such a beautiful job of, um, of scaffolding those, those assignments. Um, hey, I know we're but, just about running out of time. This is Nate. I'll just jump in with one other kind of announcement where um, we're just putting the final touches on a thing that we're calling the liquid margins collection and what it'll be is a site, a kind of library where you all as educators will be able to post any resources that you've made and want to share with a wider community. It could be anything from, you know, like an assignment to a syllabus or prompts or, you know, a video that you've done, anything that you want to share with a wider community and it'll be tagged and searchable and so on. Uh, so keep your eyes out everyone for an announcement about the liquid margin collection coming out. Uh, very cool. That sounds that sounds awesome. I'm I'm looking forward to that. I think I see someone with their with their hand raised. Um, did you? Uh, let me see. Can we allow someone to talk? I'm looking on here. Oh, did you want to um to share unmute and share a, a question or an idea before we uh, all go our own ways? It was Himen, all right. Yes, yes. Um, uh, I just wanted to say that before when I signed for this webinar, I didn't have any idea what was this all about. I just went in and I signed and I'm very glad that I was, uh, I was to be able to run all these new things. I'm very, very happy um, for what you guys presented and um, I'm very happy because I teach um, Spanish, advanced Spanish. And right now we're doing a, a, a book, a novel in Spanish, and I'm teaching the students how to read in Spanish. And this is when I come out like a perfect. So I'm very glad that it came on time. So I'm gonna, I have a lot of ideas after I see your videos to get things out to, to be able to help with them. 
and teach them how to read in Spanish novels in Spanish. So I just wanted That's to That's amazing. That. I, I love that idea. Thank you so much for, for, uh, for joining us today. It's super serendipitous. Um, yeah. That's, I think that sounds like a really great use and, and, and feel free to reach out to, to any of us, you know, we, we'd be happy. I, I know all of us in education, we tend to be pretty geeky and happy to, uh, to chat, you know, talk shop. So reach out yeah. if, if you have questions and stuff comes up. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And, um, I think that takes us to the end of the hour here. So um, we wanted to say, oops, that's not what I wanted. If I could press the right button. <laughs> um, we wanted to say thank you from um, all of us, uh, you know, from, from me and, and Brandon and Marites from the um, Contra Costa Community College Districts, but um, also a big thank you from our hypothesis team with us here today. Um, we have with us uh, Franny and, and Jeremy and Nate and Becky. So. Um, thank you all very much for joining us. The recording will be available on the Liquid Margins website um, pretty soon here. And I um, hope you all have a wonderful long weekend. Thank you so much.